This video contains full spoilers for every version of Avatar The Last Airbender. The live-action Netflix remake of Avatar The Last Airbender has recently been released, or at least as of the making of this video, and the internet has some thoughts. Now, I've never made an Avatar-related video before, but I am a very big fan of the original series and its various sequels and comics, and I figure there's probably a very big overlap between the fans of things I typically make videos about and Avatar. Obviously, there was the M. Night Shyamalan movie from 2010 that will go down is one of the single worst adaptations of anything in history, and that's made people understandably apprehensive of anything live-action related when it comes to The Last Airbender. Still, the trailers looked promising, the casting was great, so I kept an open mind, and while it's certainly not as good as the original, it's also pretty damn good in my opinion, and even makes enough changes that I think justifies its existence. It's not perfect, there are a lot of shortcomings, but I think to dismiss this series as trash, as I've seen people do online, is extremely harsh, and a little disingenuous. So, because it seems like I enjoyed it more than most, I wanted to be a bit more positive with my video about this show and try to go over everything they changed in the series that I liked and that I think made for a worthy addition to the franchise, while also being fair and including changes I didn't like as well. I won't be talking about every single change because many of them I am pretty neutral on or they're simply not big enough to mention, but the series changes quite a lot, so there will be plenty to talk about. Make sure to like and subscribe if you want me to make more avid our content or if you like my other content and let's begin going episode by episode before that though there are a few episodes from the original they didn't adapt at all the first of these is episode 6 imprisoned which is a katara centric episode that introduces haru and his father and is one of the two episodes that has literally nothing taken from it whatsoever which makes me think that for this episode and the other one they may be adapted into season 2 instead in case they don't adapt it into season 2 and this never gets adapted, I did always find this episode and the characters it introduced to be a bit boring, but also very important to Katara's development, which was a tiny bit lacking, if not very lacking in this season. Episode 9, the waterbending scroll, had elements and certain scenes taken from it, and the pirates were referenced, but the general plot wasn't adapted and the pirates never appeared, and I'm pretty much fine with that. Episode 11, The Great Divide, was similarly referenced but not adapted, which makes sense given it's a filler episode and the single lowest rated episode of the series, it's known to be the worst episode of the show. Episode 14, The Fortune Teller, was referenced. It's mostly a Katang episode, which is not something that's included at all in the season. Episode 15, Bato of the Water Tribe, had its characters used elsewhere, and some of its story, specifically Sokka doing that whole trial, was placed earlier in the timeline. And while it's a fine episode, Aang's story in that episode specifically kind of sucked, so I'm glad they skipped it. Finally, episode 16, The Deserter, had nothing from it adapted at all, and I think there's a reason for this. Aang never waterbended in this season outside of the Avatar state, which I'll get back to later, so they avoided having him firebend as well. That being said, there are some season 2 and 3 elements in this season, so I could definitely see them actually moving the Deserter, and maybe also imprisoned, into season 2, given there's nothing about them that specifically places them in the events of season 1, necessarily. The Deserter specifically, I'd be surprised if they don't adapt season 2 given it's quite important for Aang's reluctance to learning firebending in season 3, although that could also be in season 3 if they want to put it there. Okay, so let's start with the episodes, which in this video I'll be covering episodes 1, 2, 3, and 4, while a follow-up video will be covering the rest. Episode 1 is titled Aang, and adapts elements from The Boy in the Iceberg, The Avatar Returns, The Southern Air Temple, and The Storm, while also adding never-before-seen content with the genocide of the airbenders, which was a grim and dark beginning that was intertwined really well with Aang's origin story from The Storm, that set the stage as the backdrop for the series. They also explained that every other airbender from every other the temple came to visit, so they were all there when it all went down. The original show couldn't show quite that much given the rating. Here, they took the opportunity to show the brutality of it, and I'm glad they did. It's not something that is necessarily better than the original series, but it is different, and it's one of the first things that justifies this series' existence. The intro of episode 1, inspired by the intro from the original series, has really cool visuals that does kind of feel like a live action version of the original intro. It's a shame they didn't keep using it, or at least a shortened version of it, or an updated version of it going forward. It's not quite up to par with the original, not as catchy or iconic, but still, I would have really liked to have this, or a version of it, in every single episode going forward, instead of the really minimal intro we get. 
Probably the only good idea the movie had was to give Aang's tattoos an intricate airbender design, except the movie didn't even execute that well because in the movie the tattoos did not look blue. Here the tattoos are both patterned and fully blue, so from afar it looks just blue while close up you can see the details, but it still looks exactly like Aang from the show. And that is a welcome change, it's the only thing the movie added that works well, except they didn't execute it well, here they did. In Aang's first appearance in this series, we see him using the airbending in such a way that makes it look like he's kind of flying by continuously pushing air down towards the ground before falling, and then gliding. It's something he didn't really ever do in the show, but I don't really see any reason why he couldn't. This isn't a change I like per se, but it's not a change I dislike either. I wanted to mention it because I saw people complaining about it online because of Legend of Korra, because there's Guru Lahima and Zaheer who were able to fly, and Aang never was. But I don't get this complaint, he's clearly not flying. He's He's putting way more effort into pushing air down and given his power set, there's no reason why he wouldn't be able to do this. Getting to the original opening, Sokka displays zero sexism here, which leads to Aang's release being not due to Katara being angry at Sokka, but simply Katara was trying to control some water. In this moment I don't mind the change, but Sokka's sexism being removed does affect episode 2 negatively, I'll get to that, and it does affect Katara negatively, not necessarily in this scene or in this episode, but maybe in the series overall. As we meet Zuko, it's revealed that he writes everything he knows about the Avatar in a notebook and that he collects many Avatar artifacts, which then also light up right before Aang is released. Aang then later steals the notebook from Zuko, which is how he's able to learn about the Avatars while also learning a bit about Zuko himself. None of this happened in the original series, but it's a change that I really like. It makes a lot of sense that Zuko, who is hunting the Avatar for three years, would have a notebook on the Avatar and Avatar artifacts that he'd be studying on all Avatar lore in his search of the Avatar, and it works well to build a personal connection between Aang and Zuko through Aang's reading of the book, which comes into play in episode 6 in a pretty great moment. Aang already has the Sky Bison Whistle, he wouldn't get in the animated series until the Waterbending Scroll. I did like this change because it's a pretty inconsequential purchase in the original series that's used to simply escape from the pirates. Here he has it from the beginning, because why wouldn't he have a Sky Bison Whistle from the beginning when he already has Appa? But also it holds a lot more significance as we later learn he got it from Boomy, which I think in general everything they did here with the Sky Bison Whistle is just better than the original series. In the original series, Aang pretty much instantly falls for Katara and has a clear crush on her throughout the entirety of the first season, while Katara begins to develop feelings for Aang in the fortune teller. In this series, neither Aang nor Katara seem to have any interest in each other at all, which is a change I kind of like, if nothing else, because Aang is 12 and Katara is 14, but also I found the romance between them from this early on to be a bit of an afterthought, certainly from Katara's perspective. I like the idea that they'd start developing crushes on each other in seasons 2 or 3 after having known each other for quite a while, and as the actors age up a bit. After Aang is captured by Zuko, an interaction between him and Iroh is added that did not exist in the original show, which shows a bit of the complexity of Iroh who potentially even understands the motivations of the Fire Nation but deep down clearly disagrees with them which Aang senses. Aang and Iroh interact again in episode 4 in a similar scene, and both are very much welcome. If I remember correctly, I don't think Aang and Iroh interacted at all in the first season, at least not until the very end. Aang does not enter the Avatar state in order to escape from Zuko, which also leads to Zuko's ship remaining undamaged. They did this because of the episode structure. In the original, Aang went into the Avatar state at the end of episode 2, and then in like the middle of episode 3. This episode goes on to adapt his second, far more impactful Avatar state moment mere minutes later from the middle of episode 3. Because of that, while I was initially disappointed that the Avatar state was excluded, the fact that he went into the Avatar state mere minutes later, it makes perfect sense that they would not include it. Zuko then goes on to meet Zhao in practically the same context without having to repair his damaged ship. So they managed to get around that anyway. This isn't a change I'm saying that's better than the original, but I do think if they didn't change that and had the same seasonal structure, it would not have made any sense for this episode. All in all, episode 1 was really great, I just had a blast watching it, so let's go to episode 2, which is titled Warriors and adapts the rest of the Southern Earth Temple episode, the Warriors of Kyoshi, elements from the Waterbending Scroll, and even elements from Sozin's Comet the Old Masters, which is the third to last episode of the series, eh, kind of. That comes into play through Kyoshi, which I might as well talk about right now because it's definitely the biggest change. Kyoshi in this version is the first avatar that Aang contacts. 
While it's a bit weird to think that it isn't the previous Avatar, but the one before that who Aang talks to first, they also, in the original series, had him go to Kiyoshi Island in episode 4, long before Roku showed up, so it makes perfect sense he'd contact her first. Kiyoshi also steals from Roku again, the moment where she takes over Aang's body, explaining that it's only possible at the Avatar's shrine, which I guess could have been guessed from the original series, but it was never explained there. And then, the scene of Kiyoshi she in her full power was awesome. It's like getting a glimpse of what the final battle from season 3 could maybe look like with Aang. The visuals were insane, Kiyoshi felt incredibly powerful and ruthless, and it also made for a far more memorable Kiyoshi Island episode than the original, and a more memorable scene than the Roku version in the original as well. Sticking to Kiyoshi, she shows Aang a vision of the events in the north, which becomes his primary motivation for going there, which is one of the biggest changes of the show. Aang never mentions that he needs to defeat the Fire Lord and his motivation for going to the Northern Water Tribe is definitely not to master waterbending, but rather to stop its destruction, which he saw in this vision. This change does make me feel like they'll be maybe splitting the seasons into separate goals instead of connecting it all under the defeating the Fire Lord premise. And then Aang getting a vision of something that includes spirits, it makes sense. On the other hand, it feels weird and a little bit wrong that Aang didn't seem at all interested in learning waterbending until he got to the North, and even then he never actually did did waterbend outside of the Avatar state in the entirety of the season, which is really weird for a season that is adapting a season that is literally called Book 1 Water. I think they'll have a time jump between seasons and have Aang learn waterbending during that time jump. That's fine, but I do think Aang should have been seen waterbending at least a little this season, although I do think that the only reason I'm even having this complaint at all is because that's what they did in the original series. With this new series, I guess there's nothing saying that that has to be his motivation. Maybe it's a bit of a weaker one, but it's not necessarily invalid. Getting back to the beginning of the episode, Momo is introduced in a way that is a lot shorter and a lot quicker, which really does speak to the general issue with Momo throughout the season, which is that he feels like an afterthought who doesn't appear much and who they absolutely never would have included if this had always been a live action project. This definitely does make Momo feel unimportant to the point where when he was injured in the finale, while I did feel something, I think it was just completely because I was worried they'd actually maybe kill him off, and I am attached to not this Momo, but the original. He looks cute and I love it whenever he's on screen, but he's not nearly on screen enough. Appa is similar, but he has a far larger presence, figuratively and literally, more importance, and is essential to the story, so it's less of an issue. I do think that they're probably going to have Momo be kidnapped alongside Appa in Season 2, as that'll be a lot cheaper, and it will cut down on CGI costs. They'll probably do it earlier in the season this time around as well. Katara then finds the waterbending scroll in her bag, given to her by Gran Gran. The Pirates episode was cut, and it makes sense they'd have one in the Southern Water Tribe. That episode was fun in the original and all, but I wouldn't exactly say I missed the Pirates. The season also didn't do the story of Katara losing her mother's necklace, because the episode it was important to, Imprisoned, and the waterbending scroll were both cut, and I'm fine with that, although I do think, like I said, Imprisoned might be adapted into Season 2, and maybe that's when Katara will lose her necklace. Zhao and Zuko don't have an Agni Kai, which was initially disappointing, but makes sense as we get a different Agni Kai that is expanded upon with Zuko later in the season. And then the rivalry comes off as a bit more passive-aggressive, which works I think just as well. Moving into the Kyoshi Warriors adaptation, it's Zhao who attacks Kyoshi Island instead of Zuko, who joins later, which worked well to establish Zhao as a slightly more prevalent presence throughout the season. The Unagi is completely removed, which makes sense, it would have been extremely costly to include it, and they really really didn't need to do so, so that was a good call. On the other hand, I see no reason why they wouldn't have included the foaming mouth guy. It's an absolute travesty. And that brings me back to Sokka, and the removal of his early series sexism. It's just a bad change, and it makes Sokka a less flawed character with a less interesting early arc. And that also affects other things like making Suki feel less important to his arc, and making Katara feel a bit more passive and docile in their relationship. When it comes to Sokka, this is the single worst change they made. I will say, since I just realized I never mentioned it in the script, but Sokka was pretty much perfectly cast. The actor does such a good job with the like comedic timing, he looks the part, he's really really good in the role. The episode ends with Ozai appearing, face and all, significantly earlier than he did in the original. 
And this is an example of something that worked really well for the original series that would not have necessarily worked nearly as well here. Considering Ozai isn't exactly a mystery to most audiences anymore, they took the opportunity to show him in his full glory and include him in the story of the season, and I think honestly they did a great job with that. There are the many characters that if I look forward, I could see them doing better in this series. Like There are characters I could see them doing as well, but not many characters I could see them doing better. Ozai in the original was pretty much just a pure evil villain and didn't really have that much depth to him. If I'm being honest, he already has gotten more depth in his extended screen time in this season than he ever had in the original series, so I could definitely see him ending up being a better big bad for the series than he was in the original. But even if they don't, his inclusion in season 1 is something that I do think is kind of an upgrade over the original season. This episode had some great moments, but it's one of my least favorite of the season. Episode 3 is titled Omashu and adapts Jet, the king of Omashu, the Northern Air Temple, and parts of the Waterbending Scroll by putting many non-Omashu related storylines into Omashu, which is certainly the biggest change off the bat. In the original series, Omashu only appeared in the King of Omashu one 20 minute episode. Here it appeared in the equivalent to 6 episodes of the original series, which is a bit of a double edged sword. On one hand, putting so many different storylines into Omashu does run the risk of making the Avatar world feel a bit smaller. On the other hand, Omashu feels infinitely more significant and more important and also more alive. It's chock full of named characters and important storylines, which makes its eventual capture all that more significant. This, in my opinion, is an absolutely worthy trade-off. The world still feels plenty big, especially when they're flying through a big empty mountain range or forest or over the ocean. It feels like the real world, so clearly we're not going to be stopping at every single joint, we're not going to be seeing everything. So putting all these things in Omashu, it doesn't really take away from the size of the Avatar world, but it does make Omashu feel way more alive and way more important, which was a brilliant decision that did actually improve on the original. It also helps that the Mechanist, Teo, Jet, the Freedom Fighters, and the Boomy were actually all pretty well adapted. What didn't work quite as well, although it did work for the episode, it didn't really work for the season, is Team Avatar going into three separate adventures. Katara is the only one to interact with Jet, Sokka is with the Mechanist, and Aang with Teo. All these stories are well handled, serve their individual characters really well, and come together seamlessly, but it does separate the trio from each other, which then becomes a very, very recurring problem. After this, they are separate for most of Episode 4, separate halfway through Episode 5, Katara and Sokka are barely present for Episode 6, they're mostly separate for Episode 7 and also 8. The structure of the season did not allow for nearly enough interactions in quiet moments between the main trio, so their dynamic being built wasn't nearly as believable or effective, it's absolutely a shortcoming of the seasonal structure that I think it's a necessity to improve in Season 2. The episode does deviate a few more times from the original, like Zuko and Iroh going to Omashu, Zuko fighting Aang, and both Aang and Iroh being arrested in Omashu, but it's never in a way that I disliked or liked until I saw what it led to in Episode 5. Aang being separated from the others, I don't love for, again, their relationship. It did work for the episode, but again, not the season, while Iroh being arrested led to some of the best moments of the season. Rewinding a bit, the episode began with the introduction of Azula, who, in a completely original scene, lures rebel Fire Nation civilians into a trap for which they're burned alive. First of all, a fantastic introduction to this character while also successfully showing another side to the Fire Nation, that there are actually real people living there who want the Fire Lord taken out and don't want to live under his oppression anymore. Now, Azula did not appear in the original season aside from a cameo. But if I'm being honest, with the story they came up with here and where it ended up, basically every single Azula appearance in this season made me appreciate the fact that she's in it more and more. She doesn't start off as the perfect child who could do no wrong, she earns that respect from Ozai throughout the season, while Ozai uses Zuko as motivation for Azula, who he clearly sees as the more capable sibling. Initially, it did seem like they were switching the family dynamic, and they did change it a little bit, but by the end of the season, it's clear that while this version of Ozai does force Azula, Azula to demand respect, he clearly favors her greatly over Zuko, who he sees as weak and good for nothing aside from building up Azula, which is kind of just like a more complex and also more subtle
subtle version of the exact same family dynamic from the original series. Honestly, I love what they did with the Zula in this season. I'll get back to it in the second to last episode where she has her big lightning moment. That's going to be in part two. This was a pretty good episode, but episode four is even better. Titled Into the Dark, it adapts a lot of episodes. The King of Omashu, Jet, The Spirit World, which is the Winter Solstice part one, the Northern Air Temple, and even season two in three episodes like The Cave of Two Lovers, and scenes inspired by the tales of Bossing Sei and the Western Air Temple. It's from all over the series. As I mentioned earlier, Aang and Iroh have another new conversation, which I really love, but then we're introduced to Boomy. The old person makeup is a bit off, but aside from that, I honestly think they pretty much nailed the character. He comes off as just as wacky and just as funny. The scene with him and Aang riding down the delivery system right at the end of this episode felt ripped right out of the original series. But also, and this is a change, he kind of makes a bit more of a point compared to the original Boomy. Boomy's motivation in the original show was to teach Aang the lesson that bending alone won't defeat the Fire Lord, and that he will need to think like a mad genius. Here, he tries to convey to Aang that the Avatar must make hard choices this time around, coming from someone who does feel like he's lived through those 100 years. Honestly, I kind of liked Boomy more here. Also, in the original, Aang doesn't realize it's Boomy until the end, which left little time for the two to interact with Aang knowing. In this version, that's what the whole episode is about, and I did prefer that. Sokka and Katara not being there, as I said, is a shortcoming. Again, not for the episode, but for the season as a whole. In the episode, it worked perfectly fine. What they were doing was going through one of the most surprising moments of the season, as they, for some reason, adapted an episode from season 2, and it's extremely different, the Cave of Two Lovers. The singers aren't around as much, and Sokka kind of likes them, while Aang is not involved at all. It works for what it is, I think. Aang and Katara have no romantic connection yet, like I said earlier, and it worked to build the relationship a bit between the Water Tribe siblings. In general though, while it fits the show, I do think it's strictly inferior to the original in memorability, importance, and even comedy. This storyline does bring up probably my single least favorite thing about this version of the series and that is Katara. In this series, Katara doesn't really have her motherly instincts or her edge. She's extremely docile and is almost always calm, which doesn't just feel like a different character, but it's also a way less interesting one at that. It also doesn't help that I would say out of all of the main cast, it was Katara's actress who seemed to have the most difficult time in portraying emotion or giving her lines. I do, however, think the character is entirely salvageable and she was never terrible, just never quite Katara. Kyo and Teo can improve with experience and they can begin adding more of Katara Katara's classic characteristics as they kind of do near the end of the season, but they would have to go way more into it in season 2 and onwards. So this is where I'm going to be the single most positive I ever was in this video as there are two back-to-back -back scenes in this episode that convinced me that it was the best episode I had seen so far and it's not the best episode of the season, I'll get to that in the next video. The best part of this episode is the outcome from Iroh's arrest, which has been changed from a random hot spring to being in Omashu, so he's not half naked, what a shame. He is still transported elsewhere, and it's here where I was really, I was taken aback by this series. Iroh was confronted by his transporter, an Earth Kingdom soldier whose brother was killed during Iroh's siege of Ba Sing Se. This is a completely new scene that utilizes some of what I think is the later added Iroh backstory that didn't exist yet when they were making season 1, and uses it wonderfully, showing the moral complexity of war and Iroh's dark past. With some of the best writing and, surprisingly enough, some of the best acting in the show coming from a character and an actor who appears in like two scenes. I mean the actor really took the opportunity he was given here and it came off as so three-dimensional that it kind of elevated the world and made it feel more populated by real people and it doesn't stop there either not for what I just said but also the very next scene is almost as good. A completely original new scene showing Iroh and Zuko's backstory shows what happened right after Lu Ten's death. Well written, well acted, and emotional, this scene builds the foundation for Zuko and Iroh's relationship, Zuko's role in Iroh's life following his son's death, and Zuko's inherent compassion, which becomes a core focus of his character arc in this season, all accompanied by the beautiful music of leaves from the vine. These two back-to-back -back standout scenes are some of the absolute highlights of the series that help justify its existence. There are 
things this show has done that the original never did that add this much depth, it really would have been a shame if it was never made. While visually inspired by a scene in season 3, this scene's intentions are new. To show Iroh joining Zuko on his mission, something they never showed in the original, it's emotional and does a great job of following up on the scene between them earlier. Legitimately, everything regarding Iroh and Zuko up until this point, and spoiler alert, everything after it as well, is superb. These are certainly the characters they did the best. This is an absolutely fantastic episode and my second favorite of the season. My favorite is going to be in part two. I wasn't intending on this being a two-parter, but I mean, look at the length of this video. I had too much to say. So part two will cover episodes five to eight. Make sure to subscribe so that you can be updated when that releases.